son of the Trinity, the Father. So he's eternally dependent on the Father for his own existence, for his own life. So let's end with you there. So I'm going to keep with everything that you've said. So that, everything you've said was an attack on Christianity. So why is the Quran correct? Good, that's a very good question. So once we understand that there is God, and there is one God, and there can only be one God, so our expectation from what we expect as proof and evidence for Islam should reflect that this message talks about one God in his absolute perfection and what we expect it to be as God and as his message. So you sh we should expect God to be all knowledgeable, to be all powerful, to be eternal, to be absolute, to be independent, to be ever living, everlasting. The Quran describes God in that perfection. So you'd say, okay, this book, the Quran, stands now as a candidate of scrutiny that I can actually scrutinize this book whether it's from God or not because it's qualifying what I expect it to be okay because if it says something like God someone who need to put a rainbow in the sky to remind him of a promise that he made you would say that doesn't describe God in his all-knowing nature God doesn't need reminding by a rainbow which the Bible does, by the way, in, in the Genesis accounts. So you know that very well. So it doesn't describe God in his perfection. The Quran describes God and says, God is such that Sleep and slumber doesn't touch him. That's how he is. He created the heavens and the earth in, he meaning God described himself. Because in Arabic, you have only two genders. There is no third, it, okay? In six days, and no fatigue or weariness touched him. In contrast, you'll find like in, in Christianity and in Judaism, God created in six days the heavens and the earth. And what happened on the seventh day? He rested and he refreshed. Rested and refreshed. So my next question is, You've got Christianity describing a certain limited kind of God. Yeah. You've got the Islamic faith describing an, an unlimited kind of God. So what I described so far is just telling you as a starter in terms of whether this book is worthy of even studying and scrutinizing. So, so my, the Quran... My, sorry, my question then is, what's the inherent value? I mean, he, he can describe an unlimited God and I can describe an unlimited God. No, no, what you're describing is what you're going to affirm as to the real characteristics of God. So what I'm asking you, firstly, the Quran stands as a very viable candidate for reflection. I haven't given you any proof and evidence yet. What I've offered you is that, yes, it's worthy of reflecting on because it describes God what I expect it to God to be like. Quran offers positive proof for its divine origin. And it also offers at the same time falsification test so that you can falsify that it's not from God. Okay. It's, a, it's a double way of, of establishing truth of its claim. I haven't heard that yet, but yeah. I'm, no, no, sure I'm just it. I'm just telling you it yeah. does. And I can tell you what it does. The Quran says, for example, as a falsification test, if you doubt, if you're skeptic that it's not from God, then this is what you have to do to falsify it. Okay. And it only doesn't limit you to say, oh, you have to do it by yourself. You can help and seek support and assistance from anyone else besides God to do that job. And it says, produce a chapter like the Quran, like the Quran. Because the Quran came in the language of Arabic. It came in the genre which was unlike the Arabic speech. Given to a man who was illiterate. So they knew he grew Prophet Muhammad وسلم, He grew up unlettered, not being able to read or write. And then at the age of 40, he is reciting the Quran you know, in, 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 in such a way it's not like any of the forms of speech or the poetry, the sayings of their soothsayers and so on and so forth. And it challenges them. The Arabs were masters of Arabic language at that time. They, they were in their peak of eloquence. They used to have poetry competitions and the best poem would be hung on the wall of the Kaaba. Okay? In the market of Ukaz, they had all these competitions. So when the Quran came and addressed them, if you're doubtful that it's not a revelation to 
my servant Prophet Muhammad, then produce something like it. You should, you should be able to imitate it because you are the masters of your language. And the Arabs fail to do so, and they're failing to do so today. And the non-Arabs who are masters and professors of Arabic language are still not able to imitate a chapter like in the Quran. So, so the Quran cannot, Quran was not falsified even to this day, and it's not being falsified yet. So the contents of the Quran came at a certain time in human history, doesn't it? What yes. happened before that? What happened before? What happened before that? Yeah, yeah. The Quran tells us that God is the creator, God of every people, humankind, all. God is the creator for all, all that exist. So he has sent warners, prophets and messengers to nations of the past. And every nation, every community had a warner because God is just. He doesn't punish a nation until he sends them a warner, telling them what is required of them, do's and don'ts. Otherwise, it will be unjust of God. So that means in the past, God sent to communities, warners, prophets and messengers, and the Quran describes many of those prophets and messengers, their life, their works. It talks about Jesus Christ, it talks about Moses, Noah, Solomon, Adam, David. It took us many of these prophets, important part of their message, what brought the downfall of their people for their disbelief and what they disbelief was and the nature of it and so on what made people successful and what made people unsuccessful in this life and the hereafter the Quran describes the stories and, and history of those prophets so what happened before those prophets that were sent with the message of God or the same message that the Quran came with didn't come with a new message the message of Tawheed oneness of God that you should worship none, none but God and God alone is the consistent message throughout. The differences were in terms of rules and regulations, how to conduct your life in a civic society and so on and so forth, how to deal with a criminal or a, someone who steals and someone who's a murderer. These things, legislative rulings, differed from society to society because the need of the people were different in different times and different places. Quran has come with a universal guidance and rules and regulation for all time and one, all places. That's the difference. But the core message is the same, that God is one. He created us to worship him alone. If we don't worship him, then we will go up, end up in hellfire. If we do worship God with all our sincerity in, in, in worshiping him alone, with our partners, ascribing another deity with him, then we will go to paradise, which he created for us to enjoy our life forever and forever. So this message remained the same. So positive evidence, the Quran offers in various forms as it describes. So whether it's to do with evidence from psychology, evidence from natural sciences, evidence to do with historical information that the Quran provides and no one seems to have known about it and now people realize the historical truth the Quran is uncovering or even the future things will happen. The Quran is prophesizing and it happened. So you can see that these are positive evidences for the divine origin of the Quran. You mentioned two words that were quite interesting. You said punish and hellfire. Yeah. Why is the God punishing? Because God is just. According to whose moral compass? According to God. God who exists as the only being without brought in being existence. Non-contingent. Everything is contingent. God is the non-contingent, the necessary being. He describes about himself. He says, I am loving, I'm kind, compassionate, but I'm also just. It doesn't sound very just to me if I just disagree. I mean, he can have his opinion. I, I don't necessarily have to agree, do I? Why do I have to be bound to hellfire if I don't agree? So if God creates you, gives you life, sustenance for your life, and tells you, this is what you're required to do. This is your obligation on God. And if you don't fulfill it, then why do you expect God to reward you when you go against his commands? If you are employed by a company, and this is a very trivial example, and you know, God is the greatest description, it does not compare. If you're employed in a company, and instead of doing the works of the company, you don't turn up on time, and you do the works of the competitor, for example. Why do you expect a salary at the end of the month or end of the week? Why do you expect some kind of wages coming from the company when you're doing nothing for the company? I struggle with the power imbalance. I don't see why I should be subservient. If you are given life... I didn't ask to be given life, though. So. No problem, but you are given life. Okay. 
not yeah, your it's, it's, it's not your choice. But that's my problem. It's, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's not your choice. Sure, sure. If you're in the Titanic and it's sinking, it's no point saying, why am I here? The fact that you are sinking is the problem. So the fact that choice is given already to you, you already have been given a life and given the faculties of a choice to accept or reject. It's up to you. If you want to reject it, if you want to reject God, no, listen, you can't I do. want to reject life. I, I, God has given me this life and I'm like, look, I don't really want it. I kill myself. Obviously, that's a sin. <laughs> but if, if I'm not really given a choice to even not live, it doesn't seem like a very fair... Choice. I mean, you wouldn't be able to be have a dis having a discussion if God didn't give you life in the first place. The fact that you have life, if you think about it, Having no life to life is a good thing. I mean, I don't have to go and explain to you in all the benefits of life and all the enjoyments that you're having and so on. It's because of they are not appreciating life because of some things that they need to be helped with and supported with, yeah. right? We need to not simply abandon them. We need to address their problems, their fears, their anxieties, and help them out of their suffering and misery. And then they'll come out of it and they'll appreciate more. Just because they're poor people, they don't say, oh, you know what, get rid of them because they are a waste to the society. They are a burden to the society. Just because people are ill, we shouldn't put them in a hospital, we should just destroy them by injection. No, we should help them out of their disease, out of their sickness, out of their property and so on. So the reason that God gave us a life, you see, I didn't ask for it. The fact that I have it now, I have to then be responsible for what I have. I have the choice given. Look, you can be a rebel. You can be a stubborn individual, say, I don't care, God whether you created me or not. You can do that, but with a consequence. Because he's given you life, so you have to now at least fulfill the obligation he's asking you to. If you don't want to, fine, bear the consequence. Yeah. If I enter into a contract, I'm a lawyer. If I enter into a contract, I have to sign on the dotted line in order to accept obligations. In this case, I didn't sign on the dotted line to be born, so why should I have to accept obligations? Because the fact that you are already here, in this life, the contract has already been signed. The contract is already, because God gave you this life, so it's not something like, okay, now I have life, let me sign a contract. He's already created you. If you were not created and you're asking, I have no contract to sign, you could have said something like that. You could have said, okay, I'm not. So there are people who are not created. Look, there's only a limited number of people who are created, compared to the unlimited cosmos. Those people, they haven't signed any contract. But for you, you've already brought into existence and this is already a demonstration that you are here. You know, why, why, why is it that you're saying, I didn't want to be created? Do you have some anxiety in your life? Oh no, I, I love my life. My right. Life is great. However, and I do appreciate that, you know, there is some God, there is some being that created everything that I see around me. However, I do, I do struggle with the current balance. I struggle with some God handing me out something at his mercy if he wants to, but taking it away if he doesn't want to. Okay. It feels very unfair to me. It would be unfair if God created you, gave you the faculties of reasoning, intellect, did not give you any guidance, did not give you any provisions, any sustenance, and just kept you just making you suffer and suffer, you would question it. What kind of God is that? But if God give you a clean slate, he brought you into existence with a clean slate, a bank balance like in the, with no debt, unlike Christianity with a negative balance, right? Where you're already sinful. No, 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 I'm giving you an example, contrasting. You are created with an open slate, meaning there is nothing there. No sin, no good. You make your life. That sounds reasonable to me. And then constantly, he guides you. He even inspired within you. Quran says, he inspired within you the good and the bad. And he says, successful are those who purifies their heart, their soul, and the losers are the ones who corrupts it. So he gives you an internal mechanism already to help you as a, like a head start that you know what is intuitively good, virtuous. Like how many people think intuitively killing is a good thing? Hardly anyone. No, psychopath is it's not intuitively. It's something wrong with the psychological state of affairs. Most people, they know that killing 
harming others is not a good thing. So our creator has given us within our intuition some of these qualities and asks us to ennoble us, to make us more noble, to perfect us in our characteristics, in our, in our properties, in these positive virtues. So it is not that he's left us alone in our misguidance. He sent prophets and messengers to guide us with proofs and evidence so that we are not going to be a loser in this life or in the hereafter. The not to kill rule is very obvious and obviously everyone agrees with it. There are some less intuitive rules within the Quran and within other religions as well. Yeah, give me some examples. Um, for example, you're not allowed to be gay. You're not allowed to be gay. So if God created you to fulfill your relationship between the opposite gender, that's how he created you within your DNA, within your makeup, and then you have sexual orientation otherwise, that's your going against the divine prerogative, divine law. Imagine someone says he has or she has a sexual attraction to a tree or a dog, and they have their relationship satisfied like that. God is simply saying, I did not create you like this. Remember, the whole homosexuality, people are saying, God made me like that. No, God didn't make you like this. You may develop some kind of orientation, something depending on lots of circumstances. Okay. Lots of circumstances. It could be even the epigenetics where, you know, the way your mom and dad, your mom, basically how she was dealing with in pregnancy and so on. You can have many factors, but you were not programmed by God to be in that way. Even if some kind of epigenetics and other things makes you with this kind of feeling of attraction, God is not simply saying he's going to punish you for that. He says, look, these inclinations resist and you will be rewarded for it. So let me get this straight. According to Islam, you believe that a person is Normal people are always created in such a way that they're attracted to the other gender. And if there is someone who claims that they are created being attracted to the same gender, you are telling that person, no, you are wrong. You're telling them you, what you think your identity is, you are incorrect. So you're okay. telling them what... Let me understand something about identity. If I now feel like a woman, am I a woman? Yes. Okay, what is a woman? A woman, well, I'm a clearly a woman. Because but I don't, I don't know what a woman is. Because if, if you can say I'm a woman, so would you like to explain to me what is a woman? Someone who identifies uh, identifies as a woman. And what is that? So, for example, I'm a woman. I'm very clearly a woman. I'm biologically a woman. I also. No, I don't understand what you say. What do you say? The concept of woman. What is that? Uh, let me explain. Go ahead. I am physiologically a woman. I am also psychologically a woman, so I mean you can't argue with that. I'm a hundred percent woman, right? So I am someone. I'm trying who to understand what that woman is. I, I have the physiological features of a woman that we can agree with. So physiology can describe what a woman is. No, no, I'm not. I'm not going to share. Oh, okay. So I've got physiology, but I've also got. Yeah, you know, I, I I look at my body and I don't feel dysphoria. I don't feel that it doesn't agree with my identity. There are some people in the world that look down at their bodies and feel I'm in the wrong body. I'm trapped in the wrong body, um, and that is that is something that only they can. Do. They know themselves best, and who am I to tell them that they're wrong? I'm not transgender, but I've got friends who are transgender. Sure. Um, and I, it feels a little bit arrogant of me to tell them what their identity should be. Okay, let's understand again the identity of women. So I still don't know what a woman is. You describe your physiology, your biology describes to you a woman. Are you saying if you have those biological, physiological characteristics, the physical characteristics, right from the chromosome x and x that makes you a woman well it does make me a woman physiologically right so in what way are you feeling uncomfortable on no, this? No, no. okay so, in, so so the biology describes women but you're saying there's some additional criteria that makes women to women yeah so what is the woman that this this, this additional thing describes very elusive, I agree with you, it's very hard to describe. Um, feminine traits, um, psychologically, it, again, it's very hard to describe. But for example, if, you, if I woke up suddenly tomorrow in my, in my boyfriend's body, I would feel very uncomfortable because that's not my identity. 
um, I, I, I can't I can't explain I'm not a professor in gender studies I can't sure. explain to you what a woman is but I can tell you that when a person is feels trapped in the wrong body they they disidentify and that's sure. a very difficult state for them Fine. and I just feel very uncomfortable telling okay. other people what their identity ought to be if I feel I'm a dragon trapped in a human body you would be feeling very uncomfortable no, to the dragon is obviously different wait 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 wait, wait. If I feel, it's my feeling, yeah. remember, it's all about my feeling. Yeah. Do you agree or disagree? It is about your feeling. Good. Sure. So if I feel that I'm a dragon trapped in a human body, you will feel uncomfortable to tell me I'm wrong, right? Yeah, I would. But I would also question where did that come from. That's a very why do you have to question it? Because, because it's my feeling. Because why, why do you even need to question yeah. when it's about all my feeling? I feel that I'm a dragon in a human male body, biologically. Previously she said, so, who am I to question? Brother, but it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We, we're having a very nice discussion, okay? We, we no, I'm really, I'm not challenging, I'm really yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to understand. That's what I'm trying to understand as well, like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just giving you a scenario back. Yeah. So, so I will be accepted in a society, and if I feel that now I need to do my dragonly business, yeah. you should in, impede in any way, unless it harms you, right? Imagine now, should, should I get some surgery to have fire out of my mouth, some kind of um, mechanism inside? Because I'm a dragon, and dragon have fiery, fiery things, right? right? So I should make surgery to have all this... It seems a bit odd to identify as a different species. It's not about odd or nothing. This is how I feel. Yeah. So it's my feel. Remember, identity is about I'm feeling. Making, I'm making a distinction between dragons, which are A, mythical and do not exist, and B, a different species. Okay, a tiger then. Again, a different species. It's not a mythical. Tiger. I feel like a tiger. Yeah. So, because it's about my feelings, it's not about questioning it's a different species. Yeah. Because that's me. I'm just trapped in the wrong body. So, so now, tiger. You should provide everything that I need to sustain my life as a tiger and so on, and you should respect all of that. And yeah, you should have no problem, right? No, not at all. Because clearly, it's, you're doing things that a tiger cannot do. You can, you can reason, you can talk. Oh, hang on, hang on. Yeah. I'm trapped in a human body. That's why I'm not expressing tigerly action. So why do you think you're a tiger? I feel like it. Okay. Do you have a problem with that? I don't have a problem with that. Right. So I am a tiger, right? So I am a tiger in my body. So if I now want to make surgery to have a tail... To become a different species. No, 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 no. no. It's a different species. It's not about different species. Who I am. My identity. Why are you questioning my identity suddenly? No. The question is, who am I? I am what I identify myself as. I am a tiger trapped in a human body. So if I want to now have surgery to have a tail to start with, it's okay. Species. No, you want to become who am I, tiger, I'm trapped in the wrong body. Don't men who are trapped in a woman's body have surgery to make them into a, what they think they are? It's clearly the same species. Isn't it doesn't matter what the species, it's what they think. That's the problem. Why my feeling of my identity is not respected now anymore. It's no longer, oh, you have to be within your species. What do you mean? I identify as who I am. But honestly, if you seriously be believe you're a tiger, yeah. I genuinely have no problem with that. Yeah, Unless and you go around so if I now if I now go to a GP yeah. and you are a GP, you said you are a lawyer. Suppose you were my GP, my GP, and said, look, I want surgery yeah. to have claws, to have a tail. I'm going to tell you that's not possible because I cannot transform you into a different species. That's it's not about transforming different species. Of course it is. Transplantation, transplant, give. Look, transplantation, I work in a hospital with transplants, BMT units. We are transplanting lots of things, bone marrows, transplanting lots of things. Well, all I need is a transplant of a, of a tail, tiger's tail, and I can be on immunosuppressants to make it not Obviously repressed. Well, it's not working. Well, go and establish more scientific data to give me a tail, because that's what I am. I can't put an elephant heart in my heart. Then make a heart of the elephant to transform me that works and my body doesn't reject this body which is not mine because i'm trapped in the wrong body make it work do your scientific design i mean again this is a very hypothetical not hypothetical this is exactly the gender identity that we're hearing about why are you discriminating me no no because you've got 
got a lot of people actually who are saying I'm trapped in the body of a different gender. But what I, as far as I can see, I haven't seen a, a wide group of people. What if they? What what if, what if you, you start seeing them? Yeah. If, if I start seeing them, then I'll start having questions, and then. And I'll, you'll say it's okay. Eventually, you make laws saying no. If they want to become a tiger with a tail and, and, and a heart of a tiger, it's okay. I don't, I don't know. Where 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 would we stop? Because they, they haven't existed yet. People are, people are identifying themselves as cats and dogs and wolves, many things. They're transforming themselves. Are they, are they like transplanting? No, no, they're, they're reshaping their body as much as they can. They are. Ah, so where does it stop? So what defines who you are is what you feel, right? Yeah. So eventually, for example, I can identify myself as a five-year-old, so I can go into school and do all the exams. Or well, I can actually go into sports for young, like for example, what's happening today. I can identify myself as a transgender woman and compete in women's sports that, and, win. That, and win. And win. And win. There's no problem, right? There is a problem. Why? Because you have a biological advantage. But that doesn't matter. I am a woman. When it, when it comes you are discriminating me. Who am I? Just because I'm on the wrong body. It wasn't my agree. choice. Now we agree. Actually, I do think that if a transgender woman, so she used to be a man, they grew up as a man, they now have a biological advantage. It's very difficult to say that they should be claiming the same gender in sports. I agree that that's a problem. Yeah, but you're now you are now introducing something that I do not agree with in terms of discrimination. You're discriminating me because I happen to be in a male's body, or you're discriminating me. I'm actually a five-year-old, and you're discriminating me to go into a school um, and sit with you know other five-year-olds, or. You can see the potential, right? I can go there and then win or succeed in everything in life because I identify as the king of England, for example. Um, and he's, 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 these possibilities are so wild that where is the limit? That's why we need to question the whole gender and identity business. Islam offers us that it's not what you think what you are. You are how you are created by God. He's given you. You might feel suddenly like, you know what, you're God yourself. There are people who think they're gods. Pharaoh, or Pharaoh, he said, I am the greatest of all gods. So people can identify themselves many things in terms of, you know, what they're not and so on. Islam brings people back to the reality. The reality is, he created us, and these kind of feelings and inclinations and choices, people will have. People will have a choice of attraction to the same gender, extraction to maybe the beasts and animal, extraction to like toys and trees, whatever. But God is saying, okay, you need to resist these attractions. Imagine somebody says, just imagine. I don't feel myself, I cannot control myself, but to kill, but to rape. It's all within me, it's programmed. I was born that way. I cannot but go and rape a woman. I cannot do it, it's just me. So why are you gonna blame me for it? Because that's me. Where does it stop? Islam is saying, yeah, some people may have psychopathic, for example, uh, a psychopath, may have this kind of feelings and inclinations and, and desires, says no, stop these and resist and fight those desires. And it gives you the mechanism to how to fight it. So unfortunately, because today, like um, an intelligent woman like yourself are agreeing to the societal liberal pressures of normalizing this, what's going to happen is, in the future, we won't be able to say no, because by legislation, they will say, no, you can't, I mean, you can't rectify someone who thinks he's a cat and he wants to eat cat food only. You can't do that. By law, you will be punished if you wanted to even encourage that individual and says you're not feline, you're not cat, you'll be punished for that because you're infringing on their identity. This is a mundane example. Yeah. So if we kept on allowing this liberal societal, the way it's going ahead, I'm seeing and foreseeing a future which is very not very nice. Yeah. Islam puts us in a hudud called a boundary. 
step out because no, my homosexuality no, my was a Islam. That's why we are going in not too far away from this place. Why are you? Why are you pushing me? Excuse me. Why are you? How dare you? Don't push me. Push me. You brother, brother. Brother, can you push me? Mister, can you can you leave me alone? Yeah, look here. Okay. Islam is a. Do you do you see anything? No, no, no. Excuse me. Why are you? Excuse me, brother. Me? Leave me alone. One hour when I come. No, brother. Why are you? Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. Come. Continue for one hour. It's okay. Let me ask you. You are fasting. Let me ask you a question. Say, say I am fasting. In this way. Right. Come here in this way. Marshal, problem solved. Why Assam is a discriminating uh, woman by not uh, going in a paradise? Islam is putting a woman in a hellfire. Why is that? Okay. Why is that? Um, right. To continue, as you were saying. Um, first, this one. Answer the question first. Because in the Quran, God Answer says. The question first. God says, the mu'minin or mu'minat. Shall I give you the verse? It gives you a black and white statement of believing men and believing women, righteous men and righteous women, the, the ones who is, uh, you know, okay. the one who yeah, 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 yeah. men and women, men and women, men and women, women, women. That's false. So, sorry, can, can I? That's false. That was actually false. my next question. Because yeah. I wanted to, I'm coming from a place of curiosity because sure, sure. I don't understand, I want to understand your religion. Fine, so, fine. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain to you. So I I'm just going to. understand gonna... your approach to women. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me show you what the Quran says about this. You can show the brother. I'll give you the Arabic and the English translation Sorry, immediately. No, 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 no English, the Quran is not in English, it's not in Arabic. Just to highlight and you will hear the difference of the words. Inna al muslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما Surely the man who submit and the woman who submit and the believing man and the believing woman and the obeying man and the obeying woman and the truthful man and the truthful woman and the patient man and the patient woman and the humble man and the humble woman and the alms giving man and the alms giving woman and the fasting man and the fasting woman and the men who guard their private parts and the women who guard and the men who remember Allah much and the women who remember Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a mighty reward parts so it is incorrect and a lie in speaker's oh. corner to say women are not going to go to our lives god not only specify he he even said like men and women men and women this man this man all of this so god has created us with different roles and responsibilities but in his sight the reward is the same the obligation to believe in allah and love and respect him is the same how you look on you is the same. You may have more of a responsibility, and in fact, you may have more respect than the father. At one point, a man came and asked of Prophet Muhammad who deserves more from my mother or the father in respect and so on. It's a very vague statement, includes everything, right? It's not just respect in only speaking but it for everything how you deal in track he says you know what the professor said and your mother okay. the man said and then who a prophet he said your mother and then who oh prophet he says your mother look what man is thinking subhanallah between the father and mother he's saying your mother 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 and then who says your father so here from what we understand because the mom and dad, even though they're parents, God has given certain roles and responsibilities which are different. So how we appreciate our mother and so on, how the mom, we are not even able to repay a single second of pain she endured while we are pregnant, while she was pregnant with us in her womb. The, the, the pain and childbirth that she suffered because of us. 
the pain when we were crying, we couldn't even change our diapers or our nappies, and she cleaned us, looked after us, and she would... This love of mother, if you look at the creation, how text form. So God is saying, okay, this is powerful respect. In fact, there is a hadith in a matter of, you know, in a, in a figurative way. Paradise lies under the feet of your mothers. Not literally, just to show you the respect that your mother deserves. Why Muhammad so, is so, having a so, problem with women? So Muhammad wasallam has described women in the way that Why is Muhammad deserving of her respect the women, or her power. Those who the are difference that people see will not go to the paradise. You're interrupting. And I don't yes. want to speak to you. Thank you. Come on. I don't want to speak to you. Come I'm on. speaking to this uh, lady here, if you don't mind. So you don't want to would you hear respect, the truth? Would you respect me so if I don't want to don't speak to you? You don't want to hear the truth. Uh, I don't want to speak you, to you. Is that you okay? You don't want to hear the truth. You don't, Brother, you don't want to hear the truth. This is an example from nowhere. Look, you don't want to hear uh, the truth. If you don't mind, I don't want to speak to you. You don't want to hear the truth. Right. Uh, this is just an is example. Is it hurting about, you? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Is the truth hurting so, you? The Prophet Islam talked about the the man Muhammad and woman. himself said you were the woman will not enter into please, paradise please. because don't they are menstruating. Because, 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 they are I, I will ask a question. Yeah, what, is, what is the attitude of Islam towards menstruating women? Okay. Menstruating women should not be harmed. So they should not, you men who are husbands of menstruating women should not have sexual intimacy when she's into menstruation because that will be a harm, a physical harm as well. Okay? Not only just hygienic thing, it's a harm. So stay away of sexual intimacy when she's menstruating. Is that all the Quran says? The Quran says other. They ask you, yes, alunaka anil mahiyud. They ask you about mahi menstruation. Say, this is other. What is the English uh, unit? Yeah. Allah said in Quran. I'll, I'll bring it. 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 I'll yeah. And they ask you about menstruation, say it is harm, other. So keep away from the wives during menstruation and do not approach them until they're pure, meaning they're already finished and they're clean. And do not approach them until they're pure and when they have purified themselves, then come to them from where Allah has ordained for you. Indeed, Allah loves those who are constantly repented and love those who are purified themselves. Yeah. You women are a piece of cultivation because this is where you have your next generation. That's okay? insult. Your offspring comes from them for you. So come to your place of cultivation however you wish and put forth for yourself and fear Allah and know that you will meet Him, meet Allah and give good tidings to the believers. So it doesn't say about some people like to think like menstruation means women are totally uh, an, an impure and so on. Not so some people. You're it's simply perfect. saying she's, because we know when people are in their menses in their periods, they're under a lot of emotional, psychological stress that's all associated with this. And people don't pray. Yeah. Oh yes. Subhanallah. This is the point. If people, women, are in their menstruation, they're exempt from fasting, or exempt from even praying. They can make this up later. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why they cannot enter in the paradise. Now, um, I, I, I don't know what this gentleman is saying. Heckler, heckler. Um, I, I don't know. Is, is there, is there, is there, you can leave the heckless. Okay, you can jump off a heckler. Your prophet is saying this. I just, saying, I just showed you what the Quran says women. about women. Cannot yes. enter into well, paradise because they are menstruating. Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. There is an Sahi obvious Sahi Muslim. issue with that passage. Oh, What's the issue? Below. So 
not just because they are pure. It's so not you only. All Muslims, they are liars. They are liars. Even purity is about the men's the, the men's it's, it's talking about don't approach them until they have purified themselves how you purify themselves is through bath that's what he's asking you haven't had the ritual bath when you have finished your inspiration so you're not impure in the sense that like you're nudges you're like phil that's what the quran is describing the quran is saying you cannot approach her with the sexual intimacy until it's ended and they have come out of this by having a bath. Thank you. I've got one final question sure. before I go. Um, why is it that the oppression of women, and I, I can possibly anticipate a response, which is that what these people are doing is separate from what the Quran says they should be doing, right? Possibly that's your response. But my question is, why is it that there is a higher propensity of oppression of women, you know, lack of education, um, that sort of thing, you know what I mean, um, within the Islam, Islamic countries? Why is it that Islamic countries are able to accept that? Not the need to progress? Sure. Very good question. Firstly, it is not correct to say Islam oppresses women in terms of education and their progression. No, I, I, should, I should say, um, I, I'm making a clear distinction between what the Quran says and what people do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm giving you a broader understanding of from the source itself. The Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says, or Muslim in some reward, or Kamakama, Tala Ali Islam. Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. So there are some narrations which talks about men and women. First word in Quran. Yeah, yeah. Quran. Read in the rail. Yeah. Brother, yes, that's right. Yes, so the Prophet said it's an obligation. The religion that we have today, you'll be surprised. The knowledge of the religion is transmitted by a lot of women, if not most of our religion. Aisha radiallahu anha transmitted so much of the knowledge of our religion. If I were to ask you from any culture for the last 1000 years, let's go back say 200 years in 18th century to 1000 years. Let us find out women scholars in every society, every culture, and their contribution. You will struggle to find and to name women scholars, scientists, philosophers, and so on, throughout the world. But you'll be surprised to hear, in Islam, if you were to ask me now, I can give you 30 volume work. I'm actually not surprised. I know, I know that yeah, about yeah. Islam. So I'm, I'm just telling you, 30 volume work of yeah. Muslim Sahabiyat, of women who contributed to knowledge, civilization, and so on and so forth, and passing this knowledge. The first university in the world, in Morocco, was by someone called Fatima, a woman, okay? From, of course, an Islamic background, she's Muslim. So, Islam never discouraged women from learning and to, to preach. As I said, many scholars today they have women teachers where they have to get the certificate from because they are the top ones are women and that continued what happened is as many societies of islamic lands it's a long history islam got the as a state level spliced by imperial forces of different others france britain and, and all other stuff in, from the 1924 i think last or something right and they instigated puppet regimes, puppet rulers, and so on. And the whole idea was, yes, we will let you have your state back, but in our terms, they will do what we ask them to do. So they were puppet regimes, so they corrupted the education system and instilled in a system which was secularized, non-Islamic, and that's why the product was there coming from generation after generation. If you go to Emirates now in some countries in the Middle East, the majority of the people are women scholars studying in university. A woman, majority of them, educated and women. Some countries like Afghanistan, which is the scapegoat and in the media, they're not sending women to education and so on. That's their particular way of thinking and their approach they're doing. Islam never discouraged 
as we said, they have taken a stance. I don't want to defend them. I don't want to criticize them because it's an isolated case. But everywhere else, Islam doesn't discourage, rather it encourages you. It makes you obligatory, as I said. It is obligatory on every Muslim to acquire knowledge. The scholars would say, the, the first and foremost obligation is about religious knowledge. But women and then secondly, Iran, is, that's another scapegoat Protesting. example about Iran, yeah. right? Because Iran is another regime in which their particular understanding of Islam and so on has compromised you know, the position of women and so on and so forth. So Muslim. what we are seeing rather is example which are an isolated case. These are calls that skews the data. Yeah? Whenever we look at data, these data disquivers, these are, what's the term in, um, in statistics? I've forgotten how it escapes me. Uh, you can't use this to normalize the data. We know, we know their regimes, their particular understanding of Islam has corrupted or made it into be like that. But if you study the Islamic history in terms of approach to how women should be, should they be oppressed or should they be educated? You will see it's the opposite. My question then is separating the theory from the theology. So I, I understand that from the Quran, you know, there's equality in the Quran. Um, that's the theology. The reality is that women are being oppressed and they are being, they have to wear certain things that even if they don't want to, they are not getting the educational experiences that they should be getting. That's the reality. So my, my question then is why is it, and you, you mentioned data skewing. Um, outliers, I've got the word outliers, now. Outliers, yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you there because it does, I, I'm finding it very difficult to name even one Arabic country, one country where the majority is Islamic, where there is a semblance of equality between the genders. I think it's not an outlier. It appears to be the norm. Current society is not yes. Islamic. I agree with you. People are not implementing Islam. So we should, to give you an example, so we have a brilliant highway code that is modified and improved to a point where we want to make our roads safe. And then we find certain outliers messing around with the highway code, driving the other way, not stopping at the red light. Now, are we going to now change the highway code for them or do we want to change them to be, stop misbehaving? We need to correct those outliers who are not following a tried and tested system of the highway code which makes our roads safe for pedestrians and the commuters themselves. Islam in its governance, when all the systems in place, education system, social system, criminal system, economic systems, when you are as a whole holistically is applied, it has shown us evidence of history that it worked. It worked, it progressed and flourished. When the Queen of England didn't have a bath for a month, we had underground sewage system in the Islamic countries back then. Over overground lighting system, right? No, 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 no. Three stones. It's no, space. Three is space. Right? So Three this is what a, this is how Islam flourished with science, technology, Three advancements, right? Because of how the Islam was implemented. So we He's see, we because of some of the things I've alluded to already, um, the, the, the regime that has been in place, who are not implementing Islam, if you are not implementing Islam, you are implementing non-Islam. That's what the problem is. These non-Islam that you're going to implement will create problems and destabilization in the society, and it will create uh, harm and corruption which you wouldn't see otherwise when the whole system is implemented in entirety. So we are struggling as Muslims to remove this oppression from our lands, from our ruling elites in the systems, to bring back Islam in its place. Because at one point, to give you an example, the fifth Khalif Abdul Aziz, he was trying to give charity, zakat, okay, charity, to poor people. And he couldn't find people to give. <laughs> So Today, this, this look at how many people are poor. For Just look at it. Today, a, so many people, people are poor. There's, 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 you mentioned about imbalance for, and disparity. It's so big. For, uh, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. But Islam, when it was implemented, the Khalif, the ruler of the country, was don't finding lie, difficult to find. Don't lie, please. Don't lie. So the, the, don't the, lie. The, if he lies, I can just go on. The, the historical yeah. figure. No. Thank you. No. He is saying, Thank you. This charity, 
charity I they are collecting research. and they are collecting only for Muslims. I can, I can do my own research. Abdul Aziz, yeah? Only for Muslims. Abdul Aziz. So you can research about his life and his uh, political activities. So he was finding it difficult to find someone to give the zakat. Because the system of zakat, the charity tax is such that every Muslim, after a certain amount of wealth, they are obliged, obliged, mandatory for them to give two and a half percent of a surplus wealth to the poor and the needy. Everyone has to do that. So when this is then collected by the state level, it's a lot of money, two and a half percent of the wealth. And distributed to the poor, the poor have their rights and their shelter and so on and so forth. And not only that, of course, this is an additional bonus. Society, governments need some kind of taxation to function, right? They collect all these taxes and so on. So this, excuse the me, money, if you don't mind. Is going so when Islam collects the, the mandatory charity from the Muslims, the money is going to is in the Baitul Mal, Maja. in the treasury, so is a large portion of money with its other those who are facilities and contributions it will implement a system in which the poor will have a house over their head food on their table yeah education for the children and so on and so forth that will be the the basic the minimum thing yes, that they will right. have but unfortunately it doesn't Look, so I agree with you in many ways. Look, Muslim, there are Muslim countries because Muslims live there, but they're not Islamic countries where Islam is implemented in its entirety. They are implementing usury and interest and so on. It's like so stepping away from all the charity and stuff, which I completely—that's uh, fascinating. Thank you. In, in return, in terms of the um, gender imbalance, mm -hmm. can I just understand the stance here? Is it that essentially the uh, countries that we see in the Middle East and also in Africa that you see huge gender imbalances? Is that the stance that they're not actually implementing Islam correctly? Is yes, that yes, correct? Yes. Because Islam does not discriminate them. Because Islam did not prevent women, for example, from having their own business. That's just to give you just to give you an example islam come says according to islamic law come on, come on. if come there's a husband and a wife for example that's right. and that's a wife right. has a business the woman and she's a billionaire cannot, uh, the husband the cannot touch they even one cent or one penny from her if she wants to in give the, her one penny the, or one billion pound that's up to her country. he can even touch her she can no, if she wants no, to run no, a business and so on and so forth but what islam encourages that the business that you're going to do in public, it has to be in a way that is convenient for her, not somewhere where you have to mix man and woman and dress in your bikinis, whatever. It has to safeguard herself in the way she will interact in society. So Islam does a lot of preventative work because Islam considers prevention is better than cure. So the, the way we dress, the way we look at man and woman is to do with preventing all of that. So as an economic... Um, entrepreneur and so on she can be if she wants to but if she doesn't want to work she doesn't want to study she wants to do self-study whatever she wants to leave in the high house and she says provide me all of that i need x y z i need this i need that the man the husband has under the obligation to provide her all of that the man has to provide her and make her happy with if she wants like i don't like this house give me another house you've got money well, he's under obligation because that's how he's going to make her happy. So the man is the one with that responsibility, additional responsibility of maintaining, supporting, taking care of, of the woman. But the woman, if she doesn't want to, she doesn't have to work. So that sounds pretty unequal to me. I think there no, should no, be more no, no, men. No, no, no. She doesn't. No, Islam considers why, why Muslim, man and woman are geared uh, differently. Why is, uh, Islam considers the reality of their makeup. Women can multitask, man cannot. So you cannot just praise a man saying, yeah, oh, you're better than women. No, you're not better than women in multitasking. Women are. So you have to give the right words to do. When Islam says man are more in the physical, physique, more muscles and so on and so forth, let them do all the labor's work and so on and let spare the woman. You can't say this is imbalance because that's how it seems to be fair because of the physical makeup in their psyche and, 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 why, why and, and so on. Islam together. takes into account that differences. So that's that's why we say in general Islam seems to agree with equality but it goes one step further. It says no. It over what's the word? It goes over and says no. 
equitable treatment. So, you know about equity? Yes. The seat in the bus, you and I are there, and he's an old man, he can't stand. Equality means, if I got it first, I can sit. I don't have to stand up. Equity but means equity means he deserves to be on that seat. So Islam gives you equitable treatment to men and women and, and so on in society. Yes. Thank, Thank you very much.